Uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you all uh, so much for coming. It's great to see uh, everybody here. Um, so, I guess everybody here, uh, we've all heard of the Big Bang, but have you ever wondered what the Big Bang sounded like? Well, this morning, uh, we're going to discover how we can record the sound of the Big Bang, and more importantly, what understanding this sound tells us about the ingredients of our mysterious universe. And I'd like to start uh, with a picture like this uh, right here. So you wouldn't be able to see something like this um, in a big city with lots of light pollution, but if you get away from the big city and you go out in a kind of nice dark place, you'll see this beautiful faint band of lights all the way across the night sky. Has anybody seen this in something like this? Yeah, a few people. So this is, of course, the, uh, the Milky Way, our own Milky Way galaxy. Um, now, our, our own Milky Way, it's kind of in the shape of this delicious cinnamon pastry here. I don't know if you guys can all see that. And it's all there. So we live in a, uh, a spiral galaxy. We live in one of the arms of the spiral galaxy, kind of about here. Uh, it's about 100,000 light years all the way across. Contains about 200 billion stars. So that's roughly the shape of the galaxy that we're living in. And in this picture, because uh, we're sitting uh, in one of the arms here, we're kind of seeing the galaxy side on like that. Does that make sense to everybody? We're all kind of orientated. It's important to get uh, orientated like this. So on a night sky like this, you can only see kind of one band of the cinnamon pastry because, uh, you know, we're, we're inside the own galaxy. Uh, so that's kind of what you might see on a night sky. Um, let's just kind of zoom out. And um, if we take our pictures from all over the world, we can get a total picture of the whole night sky. So now we're kind of zooming out, and we're kind of looking at the galaxy. Well, at the night sky, so the galaxy is edged off like this. Uh, so this very talented astrophotographer, he's compiled photos of the night sky from all over the world, and he's projected them onto the onto a sphere like this. So a bit like a map of the world, you've taken the globe and you've projected it onto a surface. This is the same kind of idea, but looking up at this night sky instead of down at the globe. So we're looking here at the galaxy kind of like this now. That's how we're orientated. Uh, so this is the uh, central bulge of our Milky Way. I think there's a uh, supermassive black hole in the middle of the uh, the Milky Way, the wall orbiting around. Uh, does anybody know roughly how long light takes to reach us from the centre of the Milky Way there? Oh. Any ideas? 50,000? Yeah, it's a bad way. So, in the centre of our galaxy is about. Hmm, that's really good at it. So, the light from, the, from most of these stars that you see on the sky, that light's taken maybe tens or hundreds of years to reach us. Um, but yeah, the light in the Milky Way has taken um, tens of thousands of years. Um, does anybody know what these two fuzzy clouds down here are? Has anybody seen them? Oh, oh actually, before I forget, Yeah, so these pastries were so good, I thought I might bring some to share. Would anybody, <laughs> would anybody like one? We've got some down here. They're really good. Did I bring some for everybody? They are really delicious. They, they bake them fresh every morning. They're great. They're yeah, delicious. So, yeah, so if this was the, uh, the Milky Way galaxy, would you guys like one? There'd be, I don't know, about maybe 10, 20 billion stars in every bite. So, Hope you appreciate that. Would anybody else like something? We've got some over here. Would anybody mind helping me pass these out? We've got some people in the back. Can I do that with you to pass out? Great, thank you. Yeah, so there's going to be about 10, 20 billion uh, stars in every bite. I've got some more here. So that seems to <laughs> like that. Oh, we've got a few people at the back. Oh, yeah. 
So, here we go. Anybody on this side would like some? Would you mind helping me? Oh, you're the one working on this out there. You're really good, that much. Of how many calories in the galaxy? How about a trillion? I can't speak for these. Ah, got some over here. Can I leave these with you to make sure you cool? Brilliant. Great. Thank you so much. So that's our Milky Way galaxy, the shape of a delicious cinnamon Danish pastry. Um, oh yeah, wherever. These guys here. Um, so these are actually the, they're called the large and the small Magellanic clouds. And if we're in the southern hemisphere on a good dark night, um, you can actually see these. Um, they're really very big, they're kind of faint, so you need a dark night, but they're very big on the sky. And these are actually a dwarf satellite galaxies of our own galaxy. So if you imagine that our own galaxy is like a big city, these are kind of like the commuter towns uh, on the outskirts of the city. So uh, they are distinct galaxies. Um, does anybody want to have a guess how long light takes to reach us from these uh, dwarf galaxies here? Have some guesses here. 20 million, that's a good guess. Any other guesses? 150 million, billion, million. Yeah, so these galaxies, they're actually not that far away in cosmic terms. So light takes about 150, about 200,000 years to reach us from these satellite galaxies. So they are a long way away, but they're not quite millions of light years. Uh, uh, can everybody see this, this little smudge over here? Um, does anybody want to have a guess what that little smudge is? Andromeda, exactly right. And how long does light take to reach us from the Andromeda galaxy? Shut up. 20, not quite. Okay, so it's actually about two and a half million years. That's the light from the Andromeda galaxy. Um, I'll just mention that it's actually quite big on the sky. So. Um, if the full moon was in this picture, it would be about, I don't know, kind of yay big, something like that. So it does appear on the sky quite big, it's just it's kind of faint. So you need a, um, very basically a, a camera or something like that to collect enough light so you can see it. But the thing about this picture is even though it's just one picture, we're looking at very different um, distances, very different periods up into the past in this picture. So the stars that we're looking at, you know, tens, hundreds of years into the past. In the centre of the Milky Way, we're looking 40,000 years into the past. In the dwarf galaxies, we're looking 100,000 years into the past. And in the Andromeda galaxy, we're looking millions of years into the past. So in this one single picture, we have this amazing snapshot of some of the history of our universe. But if we look further and further back, um, we see older and older galaxies, but eventually, we're looking so far back into the history of the universe that galaxies haven't formed yet. It's so recent after the Big Bang that no galaxies have formed. And the universe is just full of mainly hydrogen gas and dark matter. And as we go further and further back into the history of the universe, that universe is getting smaller and smaller, and that gas is getting hotter and hotter. So you may be familiar, if you compress a gas, it's going to heat up. It's the same kind of idea. So as we go further and back into the history of the universe, it's getting smaller and denser and hotter and hotter. Um, until eventually, the whole universe is about a thousand times smaller than it is now. And all of the stuff in the universe is very much like the surface of our sun. So imagine the whole universe behaving like the surface of our sun. Same kind of constituents, hydrogen gas that same kind of temperature, thousands of degrees Celsius, and glowing a kind of yellow hot. So that was what the whole universe was like back then. Now we can't see that on this picture. But, why, but if we go back from that very early universe, when that whole universe was yellow hot and very hot and dense, we're looking billions and billions of years into the past. And while that light has travelled towards us, the universe has expanded by about a thousand times, it's got a thousand times bigger. So that light that was started out a kind of nice yellow colour, it's got stretched to longer and longer wavelengths. So beyond the visible uh, 
wave, a part of the spectrum. Does anybody know what kind of light we get beyond the visible uh, wavelengths of light? Ultra, so ultraviolet's actually shorter. Yeah, so you get a shorter wavelength. That's the ultraviolet light. So that's going to give you sunburn. What about longer? Infrared. Exactly. So infrared light. So from very distant galaxies, we actually have to look at infrared light because that light gets stretched out so much that it stretches into the infrared. Of course, if you have one, um, have you guys all seen a thermal camera, right? They're basically infrared cameras. So everything here is glowing with infrared light because it's heat. So infrared light, it also kind of gives us a thermal picture. What about longer wavelengths than infrared? What's longer than infrared? Radio, exactly. So if you go along with an infrared, you get to radio waves. So they have wavelengths kind of roughly about this big. What about in between radio waves and infrared? What's in that bit in the middle there? Microwave, exactly right. So we've all got microwave ovens at home. They're essentially shining microwave light on top. So whenever I talk about microwaves in this talk, I mean the light. I'm not talking about convenient microwave ovens. Um, so yeah, we've got microwaves. Now it turns out that in this early universe, when the whole universe is kind of like the surface of our sun, that light has got stretched out into the microwave region of the spectrum. And we can see it if we look at the sky with a camera which can image microwave light instead of visible light that we see here. So I'll bring that in and we can take a look at it. Yeah, so this is exactly the same orientation of a picture as we saw before. But instead of being taken with visible light that we see with our eyes, it's in microwave light. So the same kind of light is in your microwave oven. And we can still see the Milky Way galaxy going all the way across here. And in this picture, red means hotter. So you can, you can see the galaxies hot. I guess we can kind of see, I guess can we kind of see the dwarf galaxies there, just about. But in this talk, it's not actually the galaxy that we're really interested in. This galaxy is actually kind of a foreground. And if we carefully take the different frequencies of microwaves that we get, we can do a pretty good job of removing the galaxy and seeing right through it. And we get this picture here. Just by show of hands, has anybody seen a picture like this before? Seen this picture before? A couple of people, not everybody, yeah. So, this is a picture, let's just recap. It's a picture of the whole night sky. It kind of looks like maybe a piece of abstract art or something, but it's just a picture of the whole night sky. But instead of being taken with visible light, it's taken with microwave light. And just like a thermal camera, these red patches are kind of a little bit hotter, and the blue patches are a little bit colder. And this light has been traveling to us from when the universe was a thousand times smaller than it is today. Uh, does anybody know how long this light has been traveling, uh, how long it took to reach us? How long? Yeah, exactly. So, but, so this light has been taking 13.8 13, 13 billion years to reach us. So this light has been traveling towards us for nearly the entire uh, length of the universe. Um, and this is actually a picture of the universe when it was very, very young. Some people kind of call this a baby picture of the universe. Um, and this is, in fact, the edge of the, uni the, the, edge of the observable universe. Um, we're looking at the universe when the universe was so hot and dense, it's like the sun. We can't see inside the sun because it's covered in that plasma. And that's exactly what we're looking at. So our entire observable sphere... We're actually surrounded by this sphere of plasma, which is glowing in these microwaves. And this is the edge of the observable universe. And it's taken 13.8 billion years to reach us. Um, we call this the cosmic microwave background because it's in microwaves, and it's the background <coughs> to our universe. Um, I'll often call it the CMB for brevity. Uh, but this is the cosmic microwave background, and this is the edge of our observable universe. And it's one of the most valuable resources for discovering the ingredients of our universe. What is our universe made out of? This tells us a great deal. So we've learned that our universe has some very strange things like dark matter and dark energy. 
This is one of the most important ways we know about the exact ingredients of our universe. So how do we do that? So over here, this looks like the same kind of picture as the cosmic micro background we, see, we saw before. But this is not actually a picture. This is actually a simulation which was made on a computer. And this simulation was made with the same ingredients of the universe uh, that we think our real universe has, where the biggest ingredient is this really strange stuff called dark energy. And that's what it looks like. But what if we lived in a universe without any dark energy? How would this picture look different? This is what it would look like. Can anybody see a difference here? Yeah, so by eye, it looks pretty indistinguishable. But what we're going to discover this morning is the techniques we have as cosmologists to tell the difference between these two pictures and to figure out whether our universe has dark energy or whether it doesn't have dark energy. We're going to find out how we do that. Now, you might be surprised if I told you that we already actually have a good intuitive sense of how we do that. Let's take a listen. Everybody hear that? Okay, I'm going to play you another sound. Okay, what do you hear that one? Okay, so what was the first sound, sound number one? A flute. A flute, exactly. What about the second sound, sound number B? A violin. A violin. And what note? A. A, very good, very good. Exactly. So two instruments, both playing, uh, number A. Um, do we have any musicians in the audience? Put your hands up if you are. Does anybody play the flute? Any what about violin? Any violinists in the audience? The violins. Okay. The, the mystery I'd like to suggest. Yeah, so just recap. There's the flute, and here's the violin. Okay, now, I was very impressed because you guys all got that they were both the notes A, okay? But you could both hear, you could hear very easily that they're different instruments. One's a flute and one's a violin. So my question for you guys is, what's different about the sound? It's the same pitch, they're both in A, but we can tell the difference. Does anybody know? What's the difference? Harmonics. Harmonics. I've heard a few people saying harmonics. Excellent. That's great. Um, so, yeah, the reason those sounds are different are because what uh, physicists and musicians, stuff like that, we call harmonics. So how does that work? Let's take a look at how harmonics work. So the... Um, Let's start with the violin here. So the violin string, it's fixed at the bridge here and up at the top here. So um, the string can vi vibrate with anything with this kind of length, okay? So when the string is vibrating with this length, we call that the first harmonic of how the string can vibrate, okay? Let's take a listen. Doesn't sound too good, but it sounds kind of like a dial tone. That's the same pitch, the same note, A, as we heard with the violin. But instead of sounding like that nice, kind of rich, emotional sound that you get from a violin string, it just sounds like a telephone. The reason is, we just have the first harmonic. But there's other ways that the string can vibrate while still being fixed here and here, okay? And these are the harmonics. So let's take a look at the next harmonic. So this is the second harmonic. So it's twice as high, okay? The string's still fixed here and here, but if we double that vibration, we can fit in the next harmonic. Uh, that's just the second harmonic. We've got a higher harmonic, so let's take a listen. They're gonna sound pretty bad. That's the third harmonic. We can go higher and higher. The fourth harmonic, I can hear a baby crying. I'm sorry, we're going all the way up to the sixth. Uh, so I'm only gonna play you the sixth because I don't want anybody to lose their hearing, but these harmonics go all the way up here, okay? So they're higher and higher frequencies. But in all of these harmonics, the string is still being fixed at, at those two ends where it's attached to the violin. And what we get when we're hearing the violin is we're hearing all of these harmonics, and in fact many more, being played simultaneously. And if I play you back those exact same harmonics with just the right mixture, we can kind of get back to the sound of the violin. It's not exact, but it sounds more like a violin than just that first harmonic. So let's take a listen. 
Okay, now it still sounds pretty electronic, but it sounds a bit more like a real violin than just this first harmonic. And if we included all the harmonics, we'd eventually get back to something which sounds just like a violin. And that is, in fact, what you're listening to when you're hearing the violin played back through the computer speakers. And what we have up here in this bar chart is the ratio, so the mixture of how many of these different harmonics we need to play back to get a sound like a violin. So we need most of this one, a bit of this one, and then, hey, what's this one, the, the fifth harmonic? We need a bit more of the fifth harmonic than the fourth and the sixth. And when we play back those harmonics with the right mixture, it sounds a bit more like a violin. Let's take a look at how this is different for the flute. Let's bring the flute in here. That's the original sound of the flute. Let's have a look at the harmonics when we try and get back to that flute sound with just these six harmonics. Still sounding electronic, but if I play the violin again, we might be able to hear a difference. Here's the synthesized violin. Can people hear the different sounds a bit readier, okay? So we don't get that full, beautiful sound. It kind of sounds like those early synthesizers because they couldn't synthesize all of the harmonics here. Um, but this bar chart is actually really useful. Um, musicians and people like that, they'll call this the acoustic spectrum because it tells us the spectrum of which harmonics we need. And more generally, um, physicists, we call this the power spectrum because it tells us how much power we need in each harmonic. It says we need the most power in this harmonic, and then for the violin, we kind of need a bit more power here, and not so much in those harmonics. So we call it the power spectrum, and it's a really useful technique in physics to see how things are uh, oscillating like that, really informative. So that's the idea of the power spectrum for something like a violin string. What about something a little more interesting than the violin string? What about something like the surface of a drum? So what's different here? It's whereas the violin string is just fixed at those ends there, it can vibrate like this. The drum, it's fixed all the way along its edge, like this. So the way it vibrates is kind of different, but we can still do this same idea of saying, what are the harmonics we need to get that vibrations on the surface of a drum? So the first harmonic kind of looks something like this. So the whole thing is just oscillating up and down. And then the kind of analogy to a second harmonic looks a bit like something like this. So it kind of looks almost a bit like a, a Mexican hat, right? So the, the inside is oscillating in a different way to the outside, like that kind of a sombrero. With a drum, because it's a surface, there's more different ways it can vibrate. So we can get harmonics like this, where it's vibrating differently side to side, like this, okay? So those are some of the harmonics that we might get on the surface of a drum. Now we can see the same kind of thing, but in a kind of color-coded picture where like red is low and blue is high. Uh, so that's what this harmonic looks like in this kind of color-coded picture. Um, and that's what this Mexican hat kind of harmonic looks like. And that's what the first harmonic looks like. So it's exactly the same information, but just in a kind of color-coded picture. What's nice about these color-coded pictures is we can kind of stack them all together to see what the total vibration looks like on the surface of a drum. So we get a kind of pattern that looks a bit like this. And if you ever do look closely at the surface of a drum or a speaker or something like that, you'll actually see uh, this kind of pattern. So those are harmonics on a two-dimensional surface. Okay, so what does this have to do with cosmology and the edge of the observable universe? Let's go back to that picture of the cosmic microwave background. It looks like this. And it's just a picture of, this, of a surface. So we can actually do exactly the same trick as with the surface of a drum. We can say, what harmonics do we need to get back to this picture? So we use exactly the same harmonics as we saw before with the surface of a drum. I'm going to show you some slightly higher harmonics here. So we'll start at the fourth, and we can go all the way up to the tenth here. But it's exactly the same idea, except in this picture, instead of the color being how high or low the surface is, it's the temperature. So red is hot and blue is colder. And just as before, we could look at the power spectrum 
And that will tell us how we need to combine these harmonics to get back to this original picture. And this is what it looks like. So we don't need so much of the fourth harmonic, and it goes up and up and up, and then it peaks at about the ninth here, and then a little bit lower at the tenth. So we call this the power spectrum of the cosmic microwave background. Now you guys can probably see that there's more detail here uh, than we can get in this tenth harmonic. And we can actually get a more detailed picture if we go to higher harmonics. And we're not just going to go up to the tenth harmonic, we can in fact go up to like the thousandth harmonic, okay? Now I can't show you that in a bar graph like this, but I can show you just in a kind of regular picture here. So this is exactly the same picture as before, but instead of just going up to the tenth harmonic, we're going to go all the way up to the thousandth harmonic, okay? Let me show you what the data looks like from the actual cosmic microwave background. Here it is, and this is what the data looks like. So each one of these points is the power of each harmonic, how much of each harmonic we need to get back to this picture. So you can see it keeps on going up and up and up, then it peaks at about 200 and then it goes down and we get these oscillations here. And this is how we quantify that data that we get from that picture of the cosmic microwave background. This is how we break it down and we can start to do kind of real science with it. So what does this look like in that universe that doesn't have any dark energy? It actually looks like this. So you can see it looks different to those observed harmonics. And what about in the universe that does have dark energy? If we get the mixture just right, we can actually fit the data very well. And this is exactly how we use the cosmic microwave background to figure out um, the ingredients that we need to get back to the universe that we observe. So often in physics, we kind of talk about analogies, and we say, you know, this is a, a bit like you know, a, a slinky or a bowling ball or something like that. And here we've been making this analogy between uh, the harmonics of uh, musical instruments and violins and flutes and the harmonics that we see in the cosmic microwave background. Except the thing that's different here is that it's not just an analogy. These really are harmonics of sound waves. Now, I'm sure you guys have all heard that there's no sound in space because there's no air. But when the universe was a thousand times smaller than it is now, the universe was dense enough that sound waves could travel through the universe. And where those sound waves were dense, um, that's where we're seeing that they were kind of heated up a bit, we're seeing these red patches. And where those sound waves were less dense, that's where we're seeing these cooler patches. And this power spectrum, or acoustic spectrum, is in fact the acoustic spectrum of those sound waves. So this really is the acoustic spectrum of our universe. So all of the structure in our universe was formed by sound waves traveling through the very other universe. And this tells us what they sounded like. So just as before with those instruments, we could go from the power spectrum and then we could synthesize what it sounded like, we can do exactly the same thing here. And we can actually hear what the universe sounded like, what the Big Bang sounded like. And that's what I'm gonna play for you guys. Now before I play you the sound, uh, we're going to have a few caveats, okay? So first of all, you might have some preconceptions about what the universe sounds like. And I'm afraid this sound is probably not going to live up to it, okay? Um, I don't know what you guys think maybe the Big Bang might sound like, like maybe a big explosion or something like that, or maybe some kind of celestial kind of magic. I'm afraid it's probably not going to live up to those expectations. The other caveat I'm going to say is that the wavelength of these sound waves is enormous. The wavelength of these sound waves is hundreds of millions of light years. Okay? So there's no way we'd actually be able to hear these sound waves with our own ears. So the sound I'm going to play, it is the real sound, but it's been increased in frequency by about 64 octaves. So if you have a piano all the way down there, you can shift it up 64 octaves, so that the sound is in the region 
that we could actually hear with our own ears. But it is the real sound just shifted up in frequency. While the sound's playing, I'm going to show you a simulation of what starts out as the very early universe, what the universe was like um, just after the Big Bang. And the simulation only takes 20 seconds, but it covers pretty much the whole history of the universe. And it starts from being a very smooth place, where it's just some places a little bit denser than others, until the end where it's going to form all of the structure that we see in the universe today. And what started that structure forming was the sound that we're going to hear. Okay, so let's take a listen, okay? Okay, so in some ways that didn't sound like a whole like a whole stack of potato chips, but that really is the genuine sound which we have processed and directly observed by looking at the cosmic microwave background. And there's a few really essential points to make about this sound, okay? First of all, it's not just completely random, it's not just white noise. We can hear quite clearly that there are specific frequencies in there, okay? And that's really important, because the early universe wasn't just a random place, there was some structure to it. And that structure is essential because over the billions of years since then, that structure went on to form under gravity all of the stars and the galaxies that we rely on for life. So that sound we just heard was actually the essential ingredient in the very early universe that we needed billions of years later to get life. So it's kind of pretty important. And you can hear that it sounds like it's going down in frequency. Um, and the reason is that as the universe is evolving, those longer wavelengths of sound can kind of come into the universe and start affecting the structure. So with a computer simulation, we can simulate that the large scale structure of the universe might look something like this. So each point here represents a very big amount of matter, kind of even bigger than a galaxy. And we can see we get these clumps, and we get these filaments, and we get these big voids. And we can go out into the recent, more sort of closer parts of the universe and look at where the galaxies are today, and we can see if they match. So that's all I'm going to show you here. <coughs> so in this picture, each one of those coloured points is a whole other galaxy which we've observed with telescopes. And we're at the middle here looking outwards. And each of those different colours um, is a galaxy from a different survey. And you can see just by eye here that there's that same kind of structure that we get these clumps of galaxies and we get these voids and we get these filaments. And in fact, we can do the same kind of analysis as before and look at the, the power spectrum and we can see if the recent universe that we observe matches with that early universe. And I think it's absolutely incredible that it does, that we can look at data from billions of years into the history of the universe, right after the Big Bang, and we can apply our knowledge of uh, how all of that stuff interacts, and we can end up calculating a universe which agrees very well with what we see today. So the last picture um, I'd like to leave you with um, is something a little bit different, um, but I figure it's, it's the last uh, talk in this series that I've been doing. Um, has anybody seen this picture before? Okay, so this picture was actually taken by the uh, Voyager spacecraft when it was just on the edge of our solar system. What do you see this little pale blue dot up here? Does anybody want to have a guess what that is? Exactly, that's us right there. Absolutely everything, um, as uh, Carl Sagan said, um, you know, everyone you've ever known, everything which has ever happened on Earth has happened right in that uh, pale blue dot. That's where it all is. Um, so I thought that kind of might be a nice picture to show uh, just at the end. Um, just before I finish, I'll just say a few kind of things uh, just before we... Uh, wrap up. Uh, first of all, tomorrow we're of course arriving at Port Canaveral, the home of the Kennedy Space Center. Um, I guess everybody here has already booked the trip to Kennedy Space Center, right? 
everybody is going. Okay, great. Do not miss it. It is absolutely an incredible place. It really is the home of human space exploration. It's where all the Apollo missions launched. It's where the Hubble Space Telescope launched. Uh, you can see a uh, space shuttle for yourself. But also, what's so exciting for me about this place is it's not just about the history, that stuff in the past. It really is the kind of present and future of space exploration. And I'm sure you'll see a lot of uh, kind of new, exciting stuff um, which we're going to see launching into space very soon. So absolutely don't miss it. It's a really incredibly exciting place. Um, the last thing I want to say um, is just thank you all guys so much for coming and asking so many fantastic questions about the cruise. It's been such a pleasure talking with you guys and hearing all of your questions. Um, it's been some absolutely uh, fantastic questions. Hopefully we'll have a few more questions for afterwards. But for now, yeah, I just want to say thank you guys so much for coming. Thank you. Um, so I think we've got a bit of time for questions now, and then maybe we can take some more questions afterwards. Well, I'm already seeing some hands up. Let's. Uh... Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'll just repeat the questions over here. The question was: um, We can use this sound technique to go back. Can we use this sound technique to go forwards? Um, so the answer is yes. We could. We we certainly can say, what is this sound going to be like in the future? Um, the reason we don't do it so much is because, you know, the cosmology, I guess over the past 100 years, has gone from being like a branch of philosophy to now, you know, it's a really very quantitative science, okay? Um, and everything we do, it's so that we can compare it with our data. So, yeah, we could say, okay, what's that sound going to be like in 100 billion years' time? But I don't know about you, but I don't think we're going to be around to, to test that hypothesis. Um, so, yeah, most of what we do is compare what we see in the, in the different parts of the universe that we can observe so that we can uh, you know, test our theory. So, yeah, your question. We've got another question over here at the front now. Yeah, what's your question? How do you build a simulation? Uh -huh. Okay, great, yeah. So, the, I guess the question was, um, um, like, what's the scale of the, the simulation, right? Uh, how many particles? How do we build it? Okay, so... Um, there's a few different approaches. In the simulation that I've shown you there, um, each um, particle has a mass of, I don't know, maybe tens of millions of times the mass of our sun, so bigger than um, a galaxy. Um, and depending on the size of the simulation and really how much computing time you can get, um, we want to have you know, billions of particles um, in that simulation. Um, and um, in a lot of simulations, um, the particles, we, they kind of interact with Newtonian physics and Newtonian gravity. So we say, okay, how far is this particle from all of the other particles, and what's the net effect of gravity on there? And we kind of let them evolve like that. So it starts out from that smooth structure and then forms like that. So um, that's called the n body simulation. There's a few others. Um, we probably, more detail to kind of chat afterwards about that. So kind of, last question? Uh, we've got a question right here in the front. <laughs> wow. Wow. I, okay, so the question was, is it true that you can still hear the Big Bang from an old TV and an old radio? The answer is yes. Yes, you can. <laughs> it's another amazing, incredible question. Yeah, so um, you, can't, uh, you can't do this with um, like a digital TV, but an old um, an analog TV or a radio. If you um, tune it between channels, so you're just getting the static, um, you know, just that, that, that kind of snow on the TV. About 2% of that static that you're picking up is actually the cosmic microwave background. So it's mainly um, microwaves, but there's some radio waves going out into it. And that's what the TV is picking up. Yeah, so yeah, an old TV tuned static, you're actually picking up those signals from the big bang. That is absolutely incredible. I'm going to give you a round of applause. Thanks for bringing up that point. That is a really very smart point. Thank you. Um, do we have to take a, let's take a few more questions and then um, have some more at the front. Yeah. Yeah, I said it's, it's probably about right. Yeah. Um, 
So there's about 100 billion galaxies in the universe, and then each one of them is going to have about 100 billion um, stars in each of them. Um, so I, I, I don't know exactly how many grains of sand there are, but, but there's, a, there's a lot of stars in the universe. There really are a lot of stars in the universe. There's, there's, there's plenty for, for everybody, yeah. Uh, got a question here in the front? Yes. Okay, yeah, so the question is, uh, there's a star called uh, Betelgeuse, some people pronounce it, something like Betelgeuse, something like that, with the different pronunciations. Uh, is it a risk? So yeah, um, so this is because this star is very big, very expanded, um, and we think it's on the brink of going supernova. So we think it's on the brink of uh, exploding and becoming a supernova. The um, question is, is this a risk? Um, I don't think it's risk. I think it's far enough away that um, we're not going to have to uh, worry about it. Uh, so throughout um, recorded history, this is something I absolutely love. This is kind of one of my personal favorites. There are recordings of uh, what ancient astronomers call things like guest stars and things like this. So these are stars which appear and are so bright that you can see them even during the day. And there's records of several of these throughout recorded history, and these were nearby supernovae, so supernovae which are going off in our own galaxy. So in our own galaxy, we get about a supernova once every hundred years. So every few centuries, we get a supernova which is bright enough that's going off in our own galaxy that, yeah, you, you, you can see it even during the daytime. Um, we have a supernova got from one of those dwarf galaxies back in uh, 1987. Um, it wasn't bright enough that you could see during the day, but astronomers went crazy for it because you could get a lot of data. So, um, yeah, I don't mean it would be a risk, but it would be super, super cool because, um, you know, we'd be able to get a lot of data. Uh, but yeah, not something to worry about. Thank you. Um, let's take two more questions, and then maybe if we've got any more questions, we can take a look at the front, okay? Um, see, let's, I think you had your hand up first, then we'll get, get to your question, okay? Yeah. Yeah, okay, so the question was, um, how does absolute zero fit into this with the space and the heat? Um, yeah, so um, when the light from the cosmic microwave background was uh, released, um, the whole universe, as I said, was about as hot as the surface of the sun, so thousands of degrees Celsius. Um, and since then, as the universe is expanding and cooling, um, the average temperature of the universe is now uh, 2.7 uh, Kelvin, um, so 2.7 degrees above absolute zero. So a Kelvin is what minus 200, and, so zero Kelvin is minus 270 uh, Celsius uh, or thereabouts. So we're talking, you know, about minus 270 Celsius is the average temperature of the universe. Uh, and yeah, and, um, we think as the universe is expanding and expanding, this temperature is just just going to drop and drop and drop and tend towards those last. 2.7 degrees Kelvin are just eventually going to tail out and approach um, absolute uh, zero, and there's kind of absolutely uh, no energy at all. So we think maybe in trillions and trillions of years' time, the universe is going to approach absolute zero, and all the particles and everything are going to evaporate. Uh, we think because of quantum mechanics, the universe won't ever abs reach absolute zero, but it will approach very close to it. And we call that the heat death of the universe, the, the end of the universe. Um, that's a bit of a kind of morbid way to end all these lectures, so let's, <laughs> let's take one more question. Hopefully it's not so much, but thank you for your question. Yeah, does that answer your question? I don't know the answer. Okay, um, I'd say it, it's not, it's also not something to worry about for now, yeah. So, um, okay, what's this question we've got here? Yeah. Yes. Ah, oh, fantastic. So, so the question was, um, how can we assume that the speed of light is constant um, throughout space? So this is a fantastic question. Um, so in some sense, um, this is something that we do kind of assume, that the speed of light is constant throughout space. But it's not something that we have to assume. There are some studies saying, okay, what if the speed of light varies throughout, um, throughout the universe? So um, one of the best 
constraints that we have on physics um, comes from stars. So, um, as I said um, a few lectures ago, a star is a balance between gravity pulling it in and the force from the fusion and that explosion pushing it outwards. And if you tweak any parameters of physics, so like the speed of light or how strong gravity is or you know, how, how heavy an electron is, uh, you really can't tweak that a whole lot before stars just go, go, go nuts and you either don't get stars or they last you know, three days or something like that and end in supernova. Um, and because stars give out a lot of light, and, and there's a lot of them, uh, we have a lot of data and a lot of constraints on how stars evolve from being born all the way through to their, their death. And everything we see there is consistent with the laws of physics being the same on those stars as in a physics lab on Earth, which I think is astonishing, right? That we can have billions and billions of light years away, and physics seems to work exactly the same way in those stars as right here on Earth. Um, but even further away, in the very early universe, um, even before we're seeing the cosmic microwave background, in the first tiny fraction of a second, um, we think the universe went underwent an incredibly rapid period of expansion called cosmic inflation. Um, and I think this is the leading theory, but it's not a totally done deal. Um, some people have proposed um, a variable speed of light as an alternative to this. And because this is such the early universe, um, and really such a wild west, you know, we don't have stars to kind of keep check of, of physics like that for us. Um, I'd say there is some possibility that a speed of light is there. So to, in, um, to, to kind of summarize, it, it really is a kind of interesting thing that we're thinking about. Um, are the constants of nature the same everywhere? And we try and test them as much as we can, and we try and see if it's consistent with that assumption. So uh, does that, okay, great. Is it different with a black hole? Should we chat about bathrooms? Because that's kind of a big, a big question. Um, okay, um, I'd love to hear some more questions afterwards. Um, I think we might maybe go for coffee after people want some more chats. So everyone's very welcome to um, join. But for now, I, I really do want to say um, it's been an absolute pleasure uh, talking to all of you guys uh, and the engagement. Um, thank you guys all so much.